especially in these times with the pandemic and all that, um, mental health is a silent disease. Uh, so I'm so happy when I saw the topic arises and so looking forward to, to hear this talk from Shadi. Um, so let me please introduce you to our guest speaker of tonight. Her name is Shadi Lagai. Um, Shadi will be exploring with the questions of the spirituality play a part in mental health. And a bit of background and bio on Shadi. Um, Shadi will be looking at overlapping and interrelated, the, in the interrelated biological and psychological and social factors affecting mental health and explores the role spirituality plays in this dynamic. She completed her bachelor's degree in psychology and philosophy at the University of Toronto and worked as a research assistant at the Campus Health and Wellness Center, where she wrote a thesis on the presenting concerns of students in campus mental health clinics. Mental health is an, is an especially interesting topic to Shadi because of its profound relevance to human life and its unique complexity. So again, welcome everyone, and I yield the floor to Shadi. Thank you so much, Wangtu, for that introduction. I'm just going to try to screen share. Bear with me as I do that. Can everyone see that properly? Okay, wonderful. Yes. And thank you so much for, for inviting me to share some thoughts and ideas on this topic. Uh, which is both interesting and important. And I have a tendency to speed up in presentation. So please let me know if at any point in time I'm going too fast or um, if I say a word that, that needs clarification, just let me know. So a little bit about this presentation. I hope to give some preliminary thoughts on the scope of mental health and its relationship to spirituality. And my aim is to draw on psychological research, my lived experience, and the Baha'i writings, especially. Um, so I'll first I'll give like some introductory context and share some secular views on religiosity and mental health, and really distinguish that from what I'm I want to share. Um, even like look at uh, what is the mind and mental health, and then. I really want to share two analogies to describe the dynamic between spiritual and mental health that I think is uh, really helpful from the perspective of religion and spirituality. So I thought it'd be funny to start off this presentation with the same words that my psychology professor had shared with some 500 students in our very first psychology class. There is no soul in psychology. Now I get it. The professor probably wanted to make a point that the topic of concern for our classes would be to understand the body and the mind through the lens of scientific inquiry. And the focus of scientific inquiry is really the examination of material reality. And for psychology, that means to consider our brains and how they function, to observe human behavior, et cetera. And the professor probably thought that there's no room in our scientific and objective study for maybe the distractions that come with speculations about the mysterious feelings and beliefs typically associated with spirituality. And yet, spirituality somehow finds itself in the scientific landscape, especially when it comes to mental health. And there are a lot of studies that show various correlations between religiosity and spiritual practices. And for example, like increased mindfulness, positive thinking and optimism, and like protective factors against depressive symptoms, et cetera. But there's a few ways this plays out. And more often than not, when religion and spirituality are studied in academic settings and writ written about in scientific articles, they are viewed through a secular lens. And because these articles and studies only study religion from the outside, they may reduce, for example, the state of prayer to an act of mindfulness or self-reflection. And I picked this article because it was just 
like so interesting the way the author describes um, prayer. They, they say that um, they argue that prayer is an imaginary social support interaction that provides useful outcomes. But ultimately this is far from the spiritual state of being that we are told prayer is in the writings of Baha'u'llah and the writings of other religious figures. So the state of one's soul, communing with our creator and partaking of the influences and powers of the spiritual realm is so much more than isolated acts of mindfulness, self-reflection, reading, or even poetry, or as it's described in this article, an imaginary social support interaction. And that's kind of something that like I really, that really strikes me and I want to emphasize that psychology and mental health is not only concerned with like the pragmatic aspects of religion and spiritual practices, but that there's also like fundamental spiritual principles that are deeply related to the field of psychology and mental health. Even when I first started learning about mental illness and treatments, it struck me that everything about mental health counseling and therapy is hinged on this core attribute of the existence of the soul, the will to change and overcome what our environment and our very senses and biological makeup may lay out before us, the desire to want that change, and the knowledge of oneself and the conditions of life that allow us to make that change. For example, I may be depressed. I may see and feel and believe that the world is a dismal place and that my life is worthless. The conditions in my environment may do nothing to disprove that experience. In fact, the hardships in life may weigh exactly that way. Even the very hormones in my body may reinforce that experience and belief. But somehow we as individuals and more consistently as a collective human body hold and act on the conviction that a life is worth living and happiness and virtues are our aim to cultivate. And to me, like that's a big sign of like what other than the soul could be that otherworldly part of us that so convinces us that a certain perception of reality is our aim to nurture over the illness that can take over every other worldly facet of the human experience. So let's look at this deeper. Before we investigate mental health, it's helpful to ask, what is the mind? So according to the Baha'i teachings, human beings are both spiritual and material. We have a body and a soul. The mind kind of rides on the intersections between the two. On one hand, we have the rational soul or the intellect, a faculty of the soul that informs our decisions and our ability to reflect and plan and pray. Powers of the soul include the power to know, to will and to love. On the other hand, we also have our brain and like the patterns of the neurons in our brain that form perceptions and thoughts and is influenced by hormones and heuristics, patterns of ways of thinking. So I believe that there are two ways of thinking about the mind and mental health, just as there are two aspects of the reality of our lives. One way considers mental health and mental illness as more of a material condition that is influenced by spirituality. And the other way considers mental health as a reflection of our spiritual growth and well being. And I'll use two analogies or two sets of analogies to describe the different ways we can make sense of this connection between the material and spiritual. Something to note is that the same way that spiritual and material realities of the mind are so interconnected, overlapping, and sometimes hard to distinguish from each other. The two analogies and perspectives I will use um, to describe this interconnectedness will likely have some overlap and will certainly have a lot of connections between them. So they're not totally like different things. <laughs> Now, the first way of considering the connection between spiritual and 
mental health draws on the analogy of the lamp and the lamp glass. Baha'u'llah says that God has endowed humans with the ability to reflect all of God's attributes. The qualities of the soul, such as kindness and justice, the radiance of spirit, joy, and generosity. And these realities lie latent within us, even as the flame is hidden within the candle and the rays of light are potentially present in the lamp. Pahala says in Gleanings, know thou that the soul of man is exalted above and is independent of all infirmities of body and mind. That a sick person showeth signs of weakness is due to the hindrances that interpose themselves between his soul and his body. For the soul itself remaineth unaffected by any bodily ailments. Consider the light of the lamp. Though an external object may interfere with its radiance, the light itself continueth to shine with undiminished power. In like manner, every malady afflicting the body of man is an in impediment that preventeth the soul from manifesting its inherent might and power. And he goes on to say that when we die and the soul is released from the worldly cage of its body, the the tremendous power of the soul will be unequal to anything that we can witness on earth. So our mind is in part the lamp glass. And for the purposes of mental health, the mind can become plagued with anxiety, trauma, depression, like schizophrenia, et cetera. All these things are part of the material body the material part of the mind, the things that are affected by worldly conditions, conditions that are left behind when our souls are released in death. So on the slide here is a rough outline of the varied material dimensions of mental health. And below the line, some of the remedies prescribed by mental health professionals. So as you can see, there's a lot that can go wrong or, or that like influences our physical and social lives from the molecular level, the biophysical level to the aspects of our relationships, the social, and even the way we perceive ourselves and the place in the world, our place in the world, which I'm treating as, as also part of that social um, material condition of our lives because our perceptions and our thoughts are are very much tied to how we interact with the world. Um, for example, like our perception of time and self. Um, so there's that. And our obsessive thoughts, for example, or the feeling of unbearable despair and weightiness of the world. It's important to know that all these things are not reflections of who we truly are all the problems with our genes and biological makeup, all the social factors and relationships we have and are affected by, and even our thoughts and perceptions of ourselves and reality are grounded in what exists in this transient and conditional world. And it is only in this conditional world that the warped lamp glass had obscured its light, the light of our souls. So the mental illness that we experience is indicative of something happening to the lamp glass, not the light within. It's not a reflection of who we are as people and our true selves. So assured that there is nothing wrong with our souls, what is essentially who we are, we can take seriously the work of getting to know our conditions and seek help from doctors and therapists, even nutritionists and trainers to take care of our bodies and mental health. In this way, taking care of our mental health is not an end in itself. That would be as silly as trying to perfect the lamp glass without any regard to the purpose it serves with relation to the whole lamp. We need to know and take care of our mental health so that we can met, better manifest our spiritual qualities in this world and better serve humanity. 
So taking care of our mental health is a means to this end, to this spiritual end. Now, mental health as a means, uh, like the lamp glass is a means to direct the lamp, light of a lamp into a room. I think this is also a good analogy to explain why we should be okay that our mental health, like our physical health, is not going to be perfect. There are minor feelings of sadness and displaced anger or traumas that we may experience in our lives, just like how the body will be constantly fighting colds and sores and acne. We use moderation and wisdom to know when and how to address our mental and physical health. And we make sure that it's always in service to the bigger picture. So for example, if you have unresolved feelings of resentment to your, towards your parents, a lot of people suffer from childhood traumas and are filled with anger in their adult lives. Um, and unresolved traumas can actually manifest in poor social skills and in how one deals with challenges when they become parents themselves. So it's really important to, to understand this like social dimension of our lives and how we are affected by the conditions of the world. And for example, like psychotherapy can be really helpful. It's a really helpful tool in providing a space for individuals to unearth some deep seated feelings in order to acknowledge their impact on our lives and ultimately let those feelings go. But therapy isn't going to stop us from, I don't know, like being angry or getting into arguments with our parents once in a while. We may even feel disappointed in our upbringing if we dwell on it. But at a certain point, Shadi, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. Would it be possible sure. to make the font a little bigger? Is that sure? Please, yes. Let's see. Let's see if I can do this. Much Is this better? Okay. Can you can you zoom out a little bit more if if you can? Sure, just, sure. Just a little bit more. Much better. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, now we're. Oh, is it? Can you okay. center it back? <laughs> yeah. Is this better? Well, I suppose it is better than than okay, earlier. It was a bit fuzzy earlier, but it's. Oh, it now? there you go. Okay. Much, we're losing the picture of your glass lamp, but the wording are perfect. We can read. That's okay. Thank That's you. Much it was better. the same quote that I read a while ago about the analogy of the lamp glass and um, how it's talking about um, the lamp glass being like our physical bodies and the light within being what's really important. Um, so I was talking about. Um, how it's important to kind of use this, this idea of mental health not being like the primary aim of our lives to kind of be okay with, I guess, like fluctuations in emotions or everything in our um, social material conditions not being perfect. Um, and I guess something in like my own life, like I remember I was going through like, a, I was going to see like a psychotherapist and the sessions which were helpful at first became less so. And I felt that it wasn't fruitful to really try to stamp out the minutia of past feelings because I already saw improvements in the relationship I had with my parents and um, my feelings from past events no longer presented serious obstacles and how I learned and served with my family and contributed to the family environment. And so I think in some ways, um, really being focused on the, the goal of our lives to, to be of service and, and to really, I guess, have our spiritual quality, qualities like manifest in this world are kind of like a gauge of how much to to seek and use these tools and how much it's they're like they're just minor parts of our lives or when when 
things in our social and environmental conditions might become debilitating and actually cause uh, mental illness or when, whether they're just the ups and downs of our regular day-to-day -day lives. So there's one other thing that I wanted to say on this matter um, with the analogy of the lamp glass and the light. And this is that because religion is meant to transform the things of this world, there are social laws and teachings in the writings of the divine manifestations of God um, and in the culture that is developed by the religious community and institutions that try to apply those teachings that are specially designed to elevate our material and social conditions. And so this is another way of seeing the influence of spirituality and religion on mental health because we are blessed with a revelation from a divine messenger who knows the human condition and gives us the guidance to be well and to put in order the social world, we can combine this with the science of our time to transform our relationships, our habits and attitudes and our systems, institutions and culture. And some of these things are actually kind of things that a lot of articles talk about when they speak of really religiosity and religion having protective factors against mental illness, like the, the things that they prescribe for us, like daily obligatory prayer, we know have like really helpful impacts on our ability to reflect our habits of self reflection and meditation and attaining those um, kinds of helpful uh, mental practices. So other pr protective factors, for example, are a culture of reflection and self-reflection and prayer, as I mentioned, um, and strong social connectedness and all the activities that we, that Baha'is have that aim to involve people of all diverse demographics and a locality and, and even having um, a common identity that transcends race and class and all these other divisions. Um, this is that those are protective factors against mental illness even the concern for the education of children and youth like the education is education is a protective factor as well so i think maybe just like as another example uh we could take parental relationships um as a, a again and i i guess i like talk about this so much because um, it is a huge mental health concern. And when I was working at the Health and Wellness Center at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, we actually found that the number one presenting mental health concern was related either directly or indirectly to family. And so like even many times in my own life, I've thought about how much the writings of the faith encourages us to obey our parents and prioritize unity within the family, even over service activities. And we have, we even have prayers, especially for our parents. And we know that our parents will have an enduring part to play in our lives, even at the brink of starting our own families, because in the Baha'i laws, parents have the right to give or withhold their consent when their children get married. And so these principles actually served as a helpful guide for me and combined with other community practices and psychotherapy and, and really like examining my own habits and attitudes. Um, I felt like this little warp in my lamp glass had been mended enough that the light of joy and service can actually shine through my relationships with my family. And so I'm sure like there, there are many other examples in, in the writings that like kind of act as a, a guide to really help us reconceptualize the elements in um, our relationships and in society. Because like even when we think about um, parental relationships in maybe North America, maybe a tendency is that when issues come up in the family, you kind of just tolerate it until you move out or you just go and uh, marry and start your own family. But like 
even in just this one example, we can see how the writings really, or like the, the teachings of Baha'u'llah really help us to, to consider it differently. So the other, the other analogy, and I'll just zoom out so you can see this lovely picture of a fountain. The second way in which spiritual health and mental health interact, I feel, is best described with the analogy of the fountain. And my explanation on this part will be much shorter than the previous section or the previous analogy, because I'm still developing my own understanding of the spiritual conditions of our lives, but I'll give it my best shot. So I will zoom into the, the quotes. <laughs> Shoghi Fendi says, <laughs> we must be like the fountain or spring that is continually emptying itself of all that it has and is continually being refilled from an invisible source to be continually giving out of the good of our fellows. And Shoghi Effendi uses this analogy of the fountain to describe how our purpose and natural functioning is to be in a state of receiving from God, our invisible source, and giving or contributing to the fortunes of humankind. Now, if the fountain stops flowing, it stops fulfilling its purpose, despite the fountain being in perfect physical order. Maybe the fountain starts becoming rusty or covered in moss because it's no longer flowing with water. Maybe the water is blocked by some obstruction and the pipes burst. Perhaps the beauty of the fountain and the benefits of its flowing waters that the garden around it depends on fades away. And I use this analogy to describe how we need our spirit to flow and Sometimes it may not be the fault of our bodies, but rather the state of action or inaction that we are in. So as, as spiritual beings, we have a thirst for knowledge. We have a thirst to serve. We want to pray to feed our souls. We find joy in uplifting music and we want to create and contribute to our community. If we are constantly bombarded with messages of self-interest, for example, and given to pampering our ego, we are like a fountain that is becoming like obstructed, like its pipes are being obstructed by random things, like maybe like dust and dross and whatnot. Um, and we are unable to, to flow. Um, or even like a bird that has become trapped in the mud of the earth and can no longer fly because its wings are caked in clay. And so this is like a complementary analogy. I'll zoom out again so you can see the bird. And then back to the quote. So this is uh, Baha'u'llah's quote where he says, ye are even as a bird which soareth, but did with its full force of its mighty wings and with a complete and joyous confidence through the immensity of the heavens until impelled to satisfy its hunger, it turneth longingly to the water and clay of the earth below it. And having been entrapped in the mesh of its desire, findeth itself impotent to resume its flight to the realms whence it came. Powerless to shake off the burden weighing on its sullied wings, that bird, hitherto an inmate of the heavens, is now forced to seek a dwelling place upon the dust. Wherefore, O oh my servants, Baha'u'llah says, defile not your wings with the clay of waywardness and vain desires, and suffer them not to be stained with the dust of hate and envy, that ye may not be hindered from soaring in the heavens of my divine knowledge. Someone told me that when you are weighed down by the superficial things of the world, you lose your ability to be moved by beautiful things. It, this was said to me in the context of how a habit of listening to a certain kind of repetitive mu music with degrading lyrics can actually cause young people 
to lose the ability to listen to the complex tones of an orchestra and appreciate its beauty. I think also another example at a collective level, maybe that in a culture where gifts are always treated as bribes and people compete to get ahead in social circles, in this kind of environment, people may lose a sense of the value of true and honest friendships and hospitality. And in conditions like that, I don't think it's surprising to find widespread causes of um, social anxiety and, and depression. And I'm sure we can find like many other examples in, in our society or, or even just when you think about the, the tests that are constantly being uh, shared with us by in the writings and, and in deepenings and discussions of, of all the things that can actually prevent us from, from manifesting our, our true nature and cultivating the true nature of our souls. And so um, back to the, the fountain. Um, there, there is sorrow and pain when a fountain is prevented from flowing or when a bird is unable to fly. And like the bird that soars in the fountain that flows, the spiritual remedy lies in, exist, in existing in ways that are in harmony with our true nature. So when we exist in harmony with our true nature, um, detached from earthly things and unobstructed by vain and inordinate affections, that is when we, we truly feel uplifted. And this, this has, like the, the words are kind of like similar, like feeling uplifted, feeling light, joyous, like true joy um, is very much related to, to like the lack of joy that we might feel in like mental illness or the despair and the weightiness of, of a lot of mental health afflictions. And so Bahala says that we can cleanse the mirror of our hearts with the burnish of love and severance from all save God. And I guess I some ways that I found helpful to kindle the fire of love and strive to be in a state of service is through prayer. Like even just earnestly asking God to help us as we examine and overcome our flaws and asking for confirmations to overcome challenges and to, to find hope again. Um, reading the, the writings that really unlock um, the mysteries of this world and um, even, even reading articles and letters from the Universal So Justice, which gives us so many, which gives the Baha'i world and like the, the world at large, all of humanity, like letters and, and guidance of um, how patterns of being of being able to contribute to our communities are being established throughout the world. Like it's very accessible now <laughs> to, to think, to have a role to play in, in making the world a better place, which is so, I think, close to our purpose in life. Um, and, and yeah, so all of these things, even speaking with friends who are conscious to cultivate habits of reflection and service, and finding small ways to be able to contribute to the well-being of others. Um, all this, all these things are ways in which we can, I guess, have that, that burnish of love and severance from all these worldly things, save God. Um, and really like the, the point of, all this I think is to, to really identify what is our true nature, what will truly uplift our, our spiritual selves and how to cultivate those. So it might even be like, do we, I guess, have um, ways in which we nurture our intellectual capacities, the capacities of the rational soul? Are we learning? Are we, are we constantly um, increasing our knowledge about the world and ourselves. This is another way 
in which we can um, also protect ourselves. So in summary, I'll share this quote by Abdu'l-Bahá. Abdu'l-Bahá said, diseases of two kinds, material and spiritual. Take for instance, a cut hand. If you pray for the cut to be healed and do not stop its bleeding, you will not do much good. A material remedy is needed. Sometimes if the nervous system is paralyzed through fear, a spiritual remedy is necessary. Madness, incurable otherwise, can be cured through prayer. It often happens that sorrow makes one ill. This can be cured by spiritual means. So I use the lamp analogy to describe the material cures for mental illness and, um, and how spirituality and, and religion play a part in that, in guiding our material and social affairs. And I use the fountain analogy with the accompanying analogy of the bird to describe the spiritual remedy for mental illness. So does spirituality influence mental health? I think yes. And uh, mental illness can obscure our true spiritual abilities, but not destroy or affect our inner light. And religion guides our material and social affairs, including things that affect our mental health, so that our lives and societies can better reflect spiritual qualities and achieve great well-being. And in the second way, our mental health can be affected depending on whether our actions and thoughts are aligned with our true spiritual purpose. Are there any questions? You, if you have the questions now, um, thank you, Shadi, so so much for this wonderful talk on this topic. Um, friends, if you have any questions, if you don't mind, just uh, either use the um, raise hand icon or you can just drop a, a line in the chat. I can call you out and so make sure that everyone have a chance to, to ask the questions. We, we have a raised hand. Uh, Nikki, please go ahead. Um, hi, Shadi. Thank you very much for your explanation. That was very informative. I have a question. Nowadays, a lot of philosophers and um, people that they are looking for mindfulness and this sort of stuff, um, they are looking at, at not soul, but they talk about consciousness. Is that the same thing? In Baha'i faith, also the soul and consciousness are the same, or is that different? That's a very good question, Nikki. Thank you for, for asking that. Um, I guess the short answer is I don't think so. <laughs> and I don't think it's the same because the soul is, is really tied with our purpose in life and um, I guess it also like it's very it's very concerned with what happens after um, life after death whereas consciousness I guess it can be I guess I don't know maybe some people think that it like endures but um, but it's it's really hard, I guess, to distinguish it from um, the material plane and and like the conditional aspect of of our lives. And I think this is like really important when we think about, I guess, things that make us truly happy. And um, it it really matters, like what's going to happen at the end of our lives. Um, but there are many different ways of, of viewing consciousness, and I am not very familiar, to be honest, with all the different ways that it could like come about. So maybe there are some views of consciousness that are similar to the idea of the soul, 
and certainly our own like I guess even like our own understanding of the soul is like limited so um there there could be definitely overlap and and um the I guess like one of the things in the Baha'i community is learning how to describe in language things that describe like the human spirit maybe even without saying things like soul or religion or life after death um, things that distinguish us from animals things that uh, really speak to our unique human faculties of being of having agency and will and attraction to beauty um, these things i'm sure like it i guess it doesn't really matter so much whether we say soul in particular or the human spirit and maybe you will find in those philosophies things that I guess are similar or parallel to those concepts. And I think that's what's important um, to make sure that we, whatever, I guess we express are in line with those concepts rather than the, the terminology or the language. Hopefully that answered the question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, but it's still, you know, they argue that this is the consciousness that it's going to stay for eternity. That's what their belief is. It's something that is kind of the same way that we are talking about soul that has got connection with the body, but is not part of the body. They talk the same way about that also. And sometimes, you know, it comes to my mind that are we talking about the same thing or is that different? And um, I know that it is in the writing that our, our memory is going to be with us when we you know we go to the next world. And um, so I was just wanted to distinguish between these two different things, you know. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely a good endeavor. Oh, go Thank ahead. You. Another question. May I just in line with uh, Nikki's question, there is a comment in the chat that I would just like to read it out. And then we, um, we have a question for Wilmer coming up next. But let me just please read out the, uh, the comment here from Melinda. Could it be that consciousness focuses more on the now or being present, whereas the soul is concerned with life after death? And we also have a another another comment here soul it's coming from oakville community is that you ramona no Got it. oh from brett from brett soul has religious spiritual implications while consciousness is more accepted by the scientific community and then from barbara shortly after becoming a baha'i in 1969 i heard this story about prayer a patient in a psychiatric hospital in New Zealand or Australia was to have an encephalogram, which I don't know what that is. If someone can explain that later, that medical term. During the test, the patient started to pray. The stylus that measures the test went to the top of the graph. The two psychiatrists who were performing the test were astounded by the graph. I understood that this showed the power of prayer. So Ramona, maybe you can explain that medical term answer, that test, that answer phallogram. It's a, um, it's, it's like a brain, brain test <laughs> um, yeah, that you, brain uh, wave test. it's like looking at brain waves that they do for like let's say if someone's having a seizure they just put like electrodes and then measure brain activity right okay thank you for these comments um let's move on with the next questions uh please go ahead wilmer okay hi good evening everyone from ottawa um thank you shadi for presenting this uh, thought-provoking and quite a 
nice, beautiful um, summary, right, of what the writings have to offer in this subject. I have uh, a few questions, but I think the, the most important one is education. So um, what, in your point of view, what do you think that uh, from what you have presented tonight or from other sources, from the writings, should be taught to primary school and high school students in order for them to have a better awareness and, and, and why not control of their habits and value system and so they become more wiser, right, later on. That's one question. And second is, um, what, in your point of view, what is the most effective way that you know so far to become aware of our habit, but to replace bad habit for good habit? So what, you know, what is the most, yeah, effective, what is something that maybe you have tried or, or you know that it is an excellent way because um, I think uh, if we replace those bad habits, uh, our life in general will improve dramatically uh, in many ways. So just leave it like that for the moment. I may have more later on. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Maybe I'll just quickly respond to the second question before I answer the first. Um, the answer is, I don't really know. <laughs> and maybe there are psychologists and um, others who with like reflection with the writings, like both combined, like learning how to overcome our habits. I think there's, there's some really good books like Atomic Habit that kind of describe like consistency and, and really making like smart goals. Smart goals are like um, goals that, that have like time and a commitment and accountability and like are very specific. And when people, for example, they, um, they choose a goal and they, they outline all those things and they visualize it and they, they make sure to, to prioritize consistency over like 100% radical change. Um, they found that those, those are really helpful. And so that's probably a good example of a thing of psychologists and, and people um, learning about the, the human condition and what, how th those things help. I'm sure there's other books that would be helpful and, and illustrate unlocking the, the secrets to overcoming bad habits. Um, in terms of like what is most important to teach children, I think, I wanna say like all of it, like and just knowing that um, our emotions, like there, there's going to be so many variety of emotions in our lives. And there are ways in which we can like help to, to take care of our bodies and our minds. And there are ways in which we can cultivate joy um, in, our, in our habits and attitudes. And so everything from like the like breathing exercises to like all those like practices and habits or even like learning that when when a challenge comes it's it's not like going to be the end of the world but it's it's something that gives us the opportunity to examine um something in our lives and to learn more about ourselves to be in like a learning mode and and also to be given the tools to to i guess like take care of all those aspects of our lives like there's just there's so much there's so much that we can educate children um and i know that was a very big <laughs> answer just, just um there's there's a lot and i'm sure other people can can share about what they think is helpful to these children too Thank you for that, Wilmer. Um, we have a question from Melinda. Please go ahead, Melinda. Hello, hi. Um, it was really, really great and interesting talk. Um, I really like that you mentioned that there were two types of businesses, the material and spiritual. And when it comes to mental health, it's a very complicated issue because many mental illnesses show both physical 
um, you know, um, like hormone imbalances or like very damage to the brain could cause various mental illnesses, right? Um, so in terms of treating things like that, um, medication, I, I, people say is needed in order to treat those because it's an actual physical condition with the brain. Um, what is your view on this? Do you think that prayer or spirituality is enough to heal these physical damages to the brain or imbalances in the brain? Or do you think both would be needed? Both medication and, you know, spirituality. Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, even like Abdul Baha himself says, like if something, like if you get a cut on your hand, like just praying about it isn't really going to help anything. You need to bandage it and take care of it. And and so it's it's very important that when we think of mental health that we consider all its physical and social aspects. Like these are these are things that we need to develop our sciences to to find remedies for. Um, and the more we like our, our science progresses, the, the better hopefully we can address these um, more psychological, more physiological basis for mental illness. But then also like, I don't know, like a friend recently went to the ICU because they had like a, a tumor and they found that like a community praying for his well-being was, was very helpful. And so we don't really know like what, are the, the delineations between the spiritual and the material world. Perhaps there are very mysterious ways in which um, prayer affect and influence our lives on earth. And, and so I think prayers will, will always be helpful, um, but certainly that is not to like take away at all from the importance of science and then physical remedies for physical causes of mental illness. Thank you. We have Ramona. Please go ahead, Ramona. Thank you, Shadi. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I, I just wanted to offer a, a, a few reflections on some of the questions posed. Uh, my background um, is uh, internal medicine, infectious disease, but I uh, had a uh, studied psychology as part of my undergrad. So a lot of these topics, particularly uh, with regard to youth mental health is sort of dear, near and dear to my heart. So in terms of the question recently posed by Melinda, I can tell you after 25 years of practice, you, someone has schizophrenia, you don't pray that away. Somebody has accelerating bipolar, uh, manic depression and a manic episodes, you can't pray that away. Um, I always say with, a, with humility, we are in the infancy in medicine of truly understanding all illnesses, particularly mental illness. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of stigma with regards to medications. I, I work, you know, I'm very open-minded to naturopaths. And I mean, if you can find me a, a valerian root that stops the hallucinations, I'll be happy to prescribe it. Um, but having said that, the same way that I don't blame a diabetic, why don't you make insulin? Why aren't you making insulin? Uh, we know that there are physiologic neurotransmitter changes in the brain of certain people. Now, whether it's genetic, whether it's life circumstances, whether it's a combination, stress changes brain chemistry. And you cannot feel guilty about that. You can't feel bad about it. You have to get treatment. Um, so in my clinical practice, like even though there's a well-quoted um, quote of Abdul Baha, be not a slave to your moods, but their master, that works for mild depression. That works for I'm feeling a little bit downed and stressed, but someone in the throes of schizophrenia bipolar, major depressive disorder, they don't have control. And it's, I love your analogy of the lamp. It's like their, their spirituality can't flourish because they're so, you know, they're feeling worthless. Everything is an effort. Everything is just negative. Um, and that needs to be, you know, uh, given appropriate um, due attention uh, without any stigma whatsoever. The same way I would never blame you for breaking your arm. Why'd you break your arm? You know, it's broken, let's fix it. Um, so that's one. Um, Wilmer asked a question about habits. Now, I'm not sure what specific habits you're talking about, but I think one very important habit that all of us can help um, with regards to mental health is just being very mindful of our thinking. You know, Abdu'l-Bahá spoke many times, you know, when a thought of 
um, war comes, re uh, replace it with a thought of peace, with a thought of hate, like you must, it must be destroyed with a thought of love. The simple act of just understanding within cognitive behavioral therapy, your thoughts affect your feelings. And then your feelings will affect your subsequent actions and behavior. They, they, so whenever you're finding yourself feeling a certain way, ask yourself, just stop and pause. If I had a recorder in my head for the last week, what's the thinking? Are you one of those, I have to, I should, I can't believe I have to, you know, if, it, if it's pressure, 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 I guarantee you're feeling restless, anxious, unsettled, disconnected, unhappy, versus a person that's, everything's gonna be great. This is a beautiful day. Look at all these blessings I have, even though life is crap, <laughs> you know? So, and once again, the extent to which you have control over your thoughts is also, it's not a simple thing. It could be very much physiologically based and that has to be addressed. But I think one habit is being very mindful of how you are thinking. Is it negative? Is it pressured? Is it critical? Um, or is it joy? Is it seeking out positive? If you're looking for things to be upset about, you become the magnet for every upsetting thing in the world to find you. Um, so that's one habit. Um, and then there's a lot of tools within the Baha'i writings, waking up with gratitude. What are the thousands of things that you are grateful for so that you kind of gauge the day in a positive way? We're told to reflect at the end of every day, be you know, reflect and account for your actions. And not just like, was I good, was I bad? <laughs> I always like to use reflection as the different roles that I have. How was I as a mother? How was I as a wife? How was I as a physician? How was I as a servant of Baha'u'llah? How was I as a friend? I might have been a great mom and doctor, but a really lousy daughter. Haven't called my parents in a week. You know, so you kind of think of yourself in these various roles and capacities and reflect and learn so that the difficulties or things that might have not gone so well don't carry into the next day. So that this time of like reflection and meditation, um, that's another habit of, you know, we're told in the writings that meditation sort of allows you to have that. Uh, inspiration, if you will, from God. To me, pray, praying is talking to God. Meditation is listening to what he has to say and finding those divine truths. Um, so I think these are some habits that um, can sort of help uh, cultivate a good uh, mental health. Uh, and then with regards to youth, I think um, just you know, providing a space where they feel comfortable, A, acknowledging what emotions they're feeling, putting a name to the feelings, letting them know, hey, your brain is developing until the age of 25. It's gonna be like this, totally okay. The world might seem like it's over, it's not. Like your brain is literally plastic and it's going to, the, the neurons that are solidified are based on the experiences. So be very aware of your experiences, especially with youth and children who, you know, their peers become a big part of, um, their self-identity, their self-esteem, um, and you know, kind of how they relate. They kind of take what they've learned as childhood and now they're kind of playing it out within their own peers to kind of consolidate a sense of self. So I think being very mindful of who your influences are, what your feelings are, um, and um, addressing any negative feelings and feeling that, you're, that it's safe to kind of discuss those things and being very uh, careful about the choices, you know, so if, if there are choices, like you have to really reflect, are the people that you're with, are the habits or um, what hobbies that you have, do they bring you joy? And that's very different than fun. You know, fun is like short-lived, it's based on something that's external. You know, when the movie is done, when the whatever party is over, the fun is gone. But joy is sort of that more internal spiritual quality that you wanna try to instill. And you find that through service and you find that through sacrifice and you find that through, um, some hardships and also teaching them that the purpose of tests and difficulties never look at it on the superficial level. Oh my gosh, I don't have friends. Oh my gosh, I'm getting bullied. Oh my gosh, this person said this about me. Always ask yourself, what is the virtue that is being tested? Because that's the goal of your life, right? So if you look at these tests and difficulties as opportunities for virtues to be refined, and if you find yourself in the same situation, then that's God kind of telling you, look, buddy, your perseverance, you got to work on it, or your patience or your forgiveness or whatever it is. It, it's really, a, it's kind of like someone lovingly telling you, you got to work on this one. 
Um, so I think that changes looking at something that's completely devastating to a learning opportunity. Um, when you focus on the virtue that is actually being tested and then sort of crafting a response and a different way of thinking and feeling and acting based on that understanding. But once again, that takes maturity, that takes conversations with loved ones and adults that can guide you that way. Um, so sorry, I, I could go on and on, but I'll stop now, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Ramona, I'm so glad you're here to share with us all those, those insights. Thank you, Ramona. Uh, we have our youth and junior youth listening in, so I was glad that you shared that tidbits. Um, that was truly something that you needed to hear. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I'm wondering if, Mangtu, may I ask it? Yes, go ahead, please. Um, Shadijan, there are people who have gone through very, very unjust situations in life. And uh, many psychiatrists think that if your life was bombarded by all this injustice, it would affect your, your later on. Later on, you would be exhausted. Later on, you would you would not be able to uh, to um, to be resilient and all of that. Simply because many of us come from countries that a lot of injustice has been going on. Uh, I'm just wondering if you share the same view that that at some point you become actually exhausted and cannot move forward or you don't look at it like that. By the way, I apologize. I didn't see the hand that that Brett has raised. I apologize. It's the old eyes. He's after you. It's all good. First, to answer your question, I think it really requires a balanced approach. So it is true that like all these injustices will have an effect on the individual, but it's kind of like the lamp glass. Like we are material social beings and the things of the world will affect us. And there, there is um, a lot of hardships that, that really just weigh people down. And especially like when you're young or even like, depending on how like traumatic it is, it, it can leave a lasting impression um, on one's psyche. But then also like the, the spirit, the soul is, is untouched by these hardships. And some people have incredible resilience and they go through like life's hardships and they, they're still so, radiant and so like and it's it's and sometimes like uh, part of my work um at the north york women's center i have the ability to to connect with clients who like some of them have experienced like abuse and and like various childhood traumas and like the way they navigate their lives and, and still have so much strength to go through um, and take care of their loved ones and, and to really like seek help. And like, it's, it's definitely um, examples against the, this, this notion that, oh, just because you go through like a lot of hardships, you're a lost cause. Um, I don't know exactly whether like I answered the question properly, but balance it, it does have an effect and it is something that we really do need to take care of and and it it it's a reason why we should really care about thinking about long-term uh, remedies for the ills of the world um, and not just like the symptoms that arise in like broken relationships or um, bad individual habits um, but also to know that we're not just, a sum of our experiences in this life. Go ahead, Brad, please. 
first of all, thank you so much, Shadi. I really, really enjoyed your your talk and the the way you articulated very clearly. You know, your thinking just came through so clearly. It was really nice. Um, I I really like the the second point that you made. I think is something that that really bears reflection for all of us. But I go back to that question about you know how can we help our youth? Because I think there's there's the the external um, this whole notion of identity and misalignment, this fundamental misalignment with our true nature, I think is the cause of so much undue stress and and burden and confusion and anxiety. And I think it's it's unfortunate because society is casting this, it's mirroring to us something that is not real, right? It's portraying us in a light that's very materialistic. Uh, very humanistic and it's um, and it's sad and it's hard, you know, growing up in this, maybe more so for younger people, you're just exposed to these images of, oh, I should be this, I should be this, I should be this. And it's just so far, it's like the bird in the muck. It's just so far from our true nature. So more just a comment and, you know, thinking about, you know, when we're raising kids to ensure that, as Ramona said, that we're very mindful around our thought processes and what's influ influencing us and ensuring that we're consulting and having these conversations about our true identity and um, I mean as a Baha'i for me the best way is reading the writings and doing that you know morning and evening and consulting but it's so powerful you know we can't we can't deny that it's everywhere and shaping us all the time so anyway I really like that point I think that's really critical thank you I think it's really true because even Abdul Baha tells us like life is a load that we sort of have to endure. Um, and one of my favorite hidden words by Baha'u'llah is where he says, you know, oh man of two visions, you know, close one eye and open the other. So close one to the world and all there is therein and open the other um, to the hallowed beauty. And, and I think with regards to the youth, it's that. It's just understanding first and foremost, your spiritual being and that the purpose of your life is to be of service and to cultivate these spiritual attributes. And anything that happens in that path is a test and a refinement of those virtues. Cause you're not gonna, I'm not gonna take my degrees. I'm not gonna take any of my patients. I'm not gonna take, you know, the house or the clothes or you don't take that. You take all of these other things. And I think that um, that being sort of first and foremost in, in their thoughts uh, will help them navigate the, the, the ups and downs. And particularly, you know, there, there are hormonal change that, changes in, in youth that really make it difficult for them to, to understand that everything that they're feeling right now, it, it will be okay. And I think sometimes just saying that, like, it's going to be all right, like it really will, not to minimize what they're feeling, but you actually really will be okay. And, um, you know, just being there to, to support them and hear what they have to say and, and, and don't feel like you have to wear a mask. I remember, um, at one, I went to a very powerful seminar once where you got a bunch of people that didn't know each other. And like one of the first exercises they made you do is to say, if you really knew me, you would know that fill in the blank. And you would have to say something just very honest about yourself. And it was just like, cut through the, cut through the veils, cut through the mask of what you present to the world of who you are. And I feel that youth sometimes part of their mental blockage is that is because they feel like they have to be a certain role or a certain perception to their family to their parents to their friends and, and it's okay to just take that off <laughs> and whatever you are because you're a spiritual being is like you're going to tell god he messed up like no <laughs> like you are a perfect in your creation with your imperfections with your struggles like you are what you're supposed to be and i think that thought can provide some comfort um, when you're being challenged. Yeah, also maybe just to add is a lot of these things are learned also through action, which is why like we talk about the youth and the importance of educating youth about their spiritual nature and the junior youth empowerment program is something that like I, I just I think is like a perfect example of youth coming together to discuss these these concepts 
with one another and have like a group of friends that they're really cultivating and examining that their their true identity and then conducting service projects and having older youth to mentor them and to not only say that you are a spiritual being and this is how we should believe in ourselves and, and contribute to the world but also like take steps to do that and and to feel the joy when when that happens um yeah learning these things in action is really important thank you for that are there any other questions I have a comment, if I may. Sure, please go ahead, please. I wanted to thank Nadim for introducing Shadi to me. I really appreciate it, Nadim. Yes, thank you. Thank you for encouraging me to, to do this presentation, both of you. I just wanted to say that, that I'm very glad um, that Shadi was able to be here and share her thoughts. Um, as you've heard, she's brilliant. And uh, I, I, I was also just like, I needed to hear what you said today. I think um, a reminder of, of some of these beautiful images within the writings um, of, of this light within this lamp glass um, and just recognizing the power in that light that whatever we may be going through, <clears throat> um, whatever physical or mental ailments may afflict us at any moment, like just a reminder that that we are that powerful light behind that 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 outer form um, is, is is just very reassuring and and that's something that I don't know I don't think I remembered that when I was in my youth you know just <clears throat> if I had known that in my youth how um, the angst that I went through might have been so much less I mean, tempered in a way that I could have not been just like so youth youth angsty um <laughs> but uh but also just these other metaphors of of a fountain that's flowing um and uh and the bird that's soaring i think these were beautiful things to remember as far as our true reality so thank you for reminding me of that shadi thank you so much for that is there any any other questions, comments? Um, I, I want to personally thank Shadi uh, to, to talk about the aspect of spirit, spirituality and mental health. Um, I know that uh, school boards have also started uh, putting out sessions for parents regarding mental health and well-being and so forth. But uh, never was the word spirituality was raised in all of these sessions. It was more about medications, you know, how, how to treat with medications, how to um, optimize sleep, how to, you know, more like, but nothing that, that is touched about the soul and the spirituality of the soul in, 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 in the tool and as a guidance um, to, in mental health. And so this, this has touched on uh, what was lacking, was missing. Um, in school, um, so I'm glad that you brought it up. And we are all spiritual beings, and the more so, uh, spiritual education in our children, uh, who will become junior youth and youth and and adults and contributors in, in society, it is so important that we enforce the spiritual education within the family, um, and and to help straighten them to become that bird that will, you know soar high up and not be solid muddy and, and fall and and uh, and then all of these negativity uh, with social media and all that around them it's so easy for them to get meshed into that mud if they don't have that wonderful tool that spiritual education to help them um, know the power uh, of their soul and and their, how pure they are and, and their um, that they they can they can soar soar high up above. So that's that's the comment and thank you. And if you um if you haven't done yet, please um include your email address in the chat box 
the weekend uh, at you on the mailing list. As you know, every week we have a, um, even if you have a suggestions about a topic that you'd like to explore, um, please share it with us. We'd love to hear. And, and I'm sure uh, for Zondi works tirelessly and very hard in, in trying to look for and invite speakers onto this forum. Um, but uh, anything of concern, of interest, or uh, any subject, please uh, share with us and let us know. And we'd love to bring it on, on our uh, weekly uh, fireside and, and present and share with, with everyone, friends and community. Any other questions? I just wanted to make another comment, if I may. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> it was such a cozy evening. It was such a beautiful evening. We, this is the first time I'm seeing Ramona and I'm going to rub it in for the rest of my life. But anyways, I mean, with all of you and Monk too, who is a beautiful MC. I mean, it was so heartwarming.